Welcome back everyone. A light crystal has fallen from the sky and embedded itself into Azeroth. Adventurers are drawn by the promise of power, but a darker figure has taken an interest. Zalatath. Once Blade of the Black Empire, now in the forefront of the Voids. May I just say, I literally made this video already. More than six days ago, I, I spoke about the crystal, I spoke about Zalatath influencing the crystal, but alright, let's see. Next gambit to take our world. But here's the thing. I'm not talking about that light crystal in Hallowfall. I'm not talking about the War Within expansion. No, yeah. I'm actually talking about the Hillsborough Foothills. Because yeah. Zalatath has actually shown up in this season of Discovery. They've added some lore around it as well. Actual canon. And this is how to think about it. Directly from Josh Greenfield, found photographs. Essentially, evidence of past events that will have an impact on the current story. Chris Metzen confirmed that with Season of Discovery, it's not an alternative timeline. It is us unearthing more of the past. So with that, let's see what Zalatath was okay, up to 20 years ago. And what other found photos there are out there. And of course, today's sponsor. HelloFresh. So here's the deal, right? I've been a customer of theirs since 2019, long before sponsors happened. And my reason was simple. I eat better, I eat tastier food, I stress less, I've got less shopping to do, and there's way less food waste, and I also save money, which is quite a lot. And if you go to HelloFresh.com and you use code BELLULARFREE, you'll get free breakfast for life. Yes, each box you receive will have a free breakfast item in it for the duration of your subscription. That's Bellular Free, or click that link down below. Now, your box will contain meals that you select from a weekly menu of over 45 options, plus some real tasty add-ons. The ingredients you get are farm fresh and they're pre-portioned, which is such a great time and clutter saver. I mean, hey, decision fatigue is a real thing. So for me, HelloFresh doing, you know, recipe planning, shopping, that eliminates stress. And I eat far more varied meals than I'd otherwise be doing myself. Now I'm just back in the city in the new year. My first box has arrived, so here's what I've got in that. They're all quick and easy meals, which are cookable in 15 to 20 minutes, which is amazing for my schedule, but they've got other types of meals like Calorie Smart or Protein Smart to help you meet your goals. So overall then, HelloFresh is just an epic quality of life upgrade, and you can check them out at HelloFresh.com and use code BELLULARFREE for free breakfast for life, which does mean a breakfast item per box for free for the duration of your subscription. That's code Bellular Free at HelloFresh.com or just click that link below for that free breakfast for life. Zalatath, a character introduced in Legion, is in the season of Discovery. Now, she's not named, but it's definitely our harbinger of the Void Apocalypse. Whenever you reach the end of Phase 1, right, it's time for you to get gearing. And the best in slot stuff is the Void Touched Crafted gear. Okay. These are essentially original crafting recipes infused with the new powers of the Void, like, say, the Void Touched Shining Silver Breastplate. I will say what I like about the use of Season of Discovery here and how Chris Mason is setting it up, it's it's a nice way of filling in the gaps, but also in all in some cases creating brand new lore in order to fit with retail. The one downside that I can see to this is, and I would understand this complaint, there may be retail andies that complain that they're now forced to play season of discovery because of this right now if they want to see the full story they're now forced to go back and play season of discovery even if that's not something that they want to do from a cross marketing perspective it's brilliant because the other the only other way you could do something like this is you literally have to give players in retail quests that take them back to low level areas that you now have to weirdly scale up in order to make that work. And, and you know, it becomes all mess. Uh, whereas this is just a cool way of doing it, I think. Plate. And that's where the new lore kicks in. In the Hillsbrid foothills, a star fell from the sky and embedded itself into the mountains. Paladins from each faction then take an interest, as if it sort of called out to them. But by the time we find the star and realize that it is in fact a light crystal, somebody is already there. A shadowy figure, a night elf in void form with a familiar feeling dagger in her hand. 
Uh, not even a night elf, by the way. Actually, one of the old classic era high elf models with face markings that very, well, easily do look rather suspicious. Mm -hmm. What's even more striking about this elf is that it's a level 63 elite. Sarfang, who had endless memes dedicated to his amazing raid wiping abilities, is only level 62, so that's perhaps a little nod yeah. that whoever this is, they're very powerful. What is she doing then? Well, we don't know, but giving us gear is clearly something fun for her to do while she's- Well, I, I, in my video, I have a theory. If you haven't watched that video, you should absolutely do that. But since you're lazy fucks and you probably won't do that, I'll just quickly recap. I think the crystal is incredibly old. The crystal that we see specifically in The War Within. I think that crystal is, is ridiculously old. Uh, that crystal was sent by the light in order to allow for light forces to arrive on Azeroth at the pristine time for the light to conquer Azeroth and take back Azeroth from the void. This was done by the light to counteract what the void had done. The void lords obviously sent their fragments throughout the great beyond and their fragments hit different planets i have a problem with this i don't believe that that is actually what happened i actually think that what what was more the titans saw it wrong the titans thought that the void simply flung their essence out into the great beyond to hit multiple planets i think the void lords knew exactly what planet they wanted to hit they wanted to hit azeroth that was the planet that they were aiming for the problem is that if the Void only sent their fragments out to Azeroth, the Titans would know shit's up. Something's weird. What is the Void after? By sending mock troops to other planets, the Titans think that this is by accident. The, the Void just arrived on Azeroth by accident because the Void is clearly everywhere. This allows the Void a lot more time to keep the Titans busy while the Void levels up sadly the titans do arrive on azeroth a little bit too early the void isn't yet ready to fight off the titans and so the titans manage to imprison the old gods the light then calls off its invasion because now that the old gods are imprisoned the light the army of the light is no longer required and this means that that crystal that we see in the war within is for now inactive it's dormant the Light, however, sends its troops, the Arathians, who are there, they're servants of the Light, to guard this crystal, because this crystal is the gateway. Zalatath, it's no coincidence that she is there where that crystal is, she wants to corrupt that crystal and turn that crystal into a gateway for the Void, so that the Void can send its troops through that crystal instead, because I think the crystal works both ways. I have a theory working at the minute. I'm still figuring it out. But I don't, I don't think there is actually such a big difference between the light and the void. Not as much as they pretend to be. And this just sort of feeds into it. The fact that Zalatath is at this crystal as well. Suggests that this was what Zalatath was trying to do the first time. When she saw this crystal, she was there trying to corrupt it to turn it into a gateway for the void. But of course, we'll, we're going to stop her and make sure that she doesn't do that. She's working on her actual plan. And to figure out what she's actually up to, we actually have got to take a look at our next expansion, The War Within. Long before Arathor fractured into the Seven Kingdoms, a group of Arathi were sent visions of a falling star. Those visions led them to Hallowfall, where they had discovered that this star had fallen so fast and so hard, it drove into the planet, embedding deep underground, seemingly right over the soul of Azeroth, almost as if it was some sort of weapon made to bind the heart of our planet, but maybe not, that last bit's just speculation. Anyway, meanwhile, Zalatath, who of course back then was bound in the Blade of the Black Empire, she was- That is an interesting point, I never thought of it that way. To be fair though, right above the soul of our planet, that, I mean, that's at the core of the planet. So, it doesn't really matter from where you enter, the crystal could fall literally anywhere. If it can go to the center of the planet, that's, that's it, right? Uh, it manages to do that. 
And I do think that's exactly why the light did that. Ultimately, it is about control of Azeroth, right? It, it, so all of the cosmological forces want control of Azeroth. The Void sent their old god machinations to take control of Azeroth. The Light sent these crystals for the same purpose. They serve as, uh, as gateways as well as maybe infections, although their infections don't seem to be nearly as powerful as that of the Void. The Void is an act of corruption that keeps spreading, whereas the Light Crystals appear to be just granting access to the light on Azeroth. Ooh, I like that, actually. That's why paladins and priests can use the light on Azeroth, is because of those crystals. Without the crystals, paladins and priests would not have access to it. I like that. I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna fucking stay with that. That's good speculation for me. Well done, Aquilon. It was being passed from hand to hand, ending up with dark iron priests. Yeah, but did the light, did the crystal always switch between light and dark? I'll be war. That's information we don't have. It could be that the crystal never switched light to dark. It is only now that Zalatath is there that the crystal started switching light to dark. Right? It's information we don't get half because we have not played yet. But that is going to be information that's important because it's either going to shoot my theory right up the dick or it's going to ride my theory's dick. We'll have to wait and see. Priestesses, ambitious nobles, and eventually even in the Legion expansion a Champion of Azeroth. All while she was working schemes to set herself free. But deeper yet, she was still working as the Harbinger. We now, and I'll cover it soon, pretty much have it confirmed that that has been her role for a very long time indeed. So, through this time, she made bargains with primal drakes. She shook the foundations of empires and slowly worked toward the downfall of old gods. Now, I'm not entirely sure I agree with him that Zalatath worked on the downfall of old gods. I don't think that that's true. I think Zalatath served the old gods, but not as a servant. I think Zalatath is a servant of the void. One that was sent as a backup. Remember, the Void sees all truths, right? Thousands of truths that the Void can see, which means the Void will have backup plans within backup plans, and they most likely saw the end of the Old Gods. Zalatath's job was to observe the end of the Old Gods and then learn from it, so adapt. To ensure that the next iteration of Void Corruption of Azeroth doesn't fall to the same weaknesses. Doesn't have the same weaknesses and doesn't fall to the same attacks. That's what I would argue. I don't think that she was slowly working towards the end of the Old Gods. Uh, I think she knew that the end of the Old Gods was inevitable though. Now free, her plans have clicked into place. She is now the harbinger of the Void and its most powerful agent on Azeroth. Some think she could be a remnant of a fifth old god. Maybe she's a servant who beat the odds and has became the master. Or, well, we just don't know yet. But whatever her origins are, they don't change the fact that her plans have been stretching back thousands of years and they're starting to pay off. Most recently in Dragon... Well, it's actually quite simple. Think of it this way. You're a Void Lord, but you have no way of entering into the Great Beyond. What do you do? You send scouts. You send a scouting force. There is one planet in the Great Beyond that you want, but you're not entirely sure where this planet is. So you send the Void Lords, uh, the Old Gods, rather. The old gods are sent out to all of the different planets to hit and to grow and to corrupt and to do all of these things until eventually three of them, four really, get back to you. They communicate with you and they let you know we have found it. We have found the planet, the one that we were looking for, Azeroth. We found it. Now you can send your harbinger. Because you know where to send your Harbinger. It wouldn't do well to tell Zalatath, well, just go. What if Zalatath opens a portal to the middle of fucking nowhere? She doesn't have any coordinates. The Great Beyond is massive. We know the Great Beyond is massive. The Titans themselves say that 
it, the Great Beyond is so large that it would take them forever to traverse it. They literally don't have time to go to every single one of the planets in the Great Beyond because of how big it is. So Zalatath needed coordinates. She couldn't just go. And that's where the old gods came in. The old gods were the scouts. They were sort of the first invasionary force meant to relay the direct location. And then Zalatath arrived. And basically, she's been spending all of her time collecting information in order to ensure that when the Void is ready, they, they have a leg up, so to speak. Dragonflight, we've seen Zalatath retrieve a hungering void essence from Galakrond, and with that, she struck a bargain with the Nerubians of Ashkahet, who we'll see in the next expansion. Now, infused seemingly with this hungering essence or whatever power, these Nerubians are becoming bigger, stronger, they're able to wield the void, they... That is going to be a playable race in Midnight. Mark my fucking word, boys. Mark my words. That is going to be a playable race. And the way they're going to do it is some of the Nerubians are not going to be okay with the Void. They're going to be Void touched, but they're going to be like, we don't want to serve the Void. We want to be free. We'll join you. And then that's going to be a playable race. Because I can't think of a single person that saw this model and didn't immediately think that would be so cool. That, that would be so cool they seemingly have got the power to actually expand their kingdom expand into what an answer is the Arathi and their light crystal so what is Zalatath getting in return for this she obviously powered these Nerubians up for a reason well first up the Nerubians are actually scouring the depths of the world for the blood of old gods Think the likes of, say, Saranite. It's got a liquid form, but of course it also crystallizes, it can be used, and it was one of the ores that we harvested a lot of in Wrath of the Lich King. Yeah. All these old gods are dead, or at least their corporeal beings are dead. That means it's a lot of blood. And Zalata. Well, okay, so this is just me nitpicking. I'm not saying Bal uh, Balil is wrong here. But I think we've been thinking about the old gods wrong for a very long time. So the way most people think about the old gods, it is, and I apologize for literally killing your eyes with this, but the way most people think about the old gods is like this, right? Four separate beings each doing their own thing, and having their own reasons for existing. But I think that is wrong. I think the way you should think about the old gods is each of them is effectively part of a void lord. So the old gods don't have individual wants, needs, or even lives. They are quite literally representations of their master they are the material manifestation of the void lord from which they originate so the old gods aren't dead yeah kind of like avatars think of them as an avatar each of these have a void lord don't know what they look like so they'll just be stickmen for this but at no point did nazoth care about being alive or not being alive or think about his own plans or not think about his own plans nazoth was simply doing what his void lord master wanted him to do that, 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 that's it that's all he ever did and so too did all of the others right each of these old gods were connected to a void lord this sort of starts to explain why the old gods were fighting amongst each other, why most of their history is just them warring, because each of the void lords that from which they come, right, this one is a baby void lord, and uh, we'll say this is Cthune. Uh, for Yogg Saron, he had one with one long leg and the other and weird face, and then we'll say Yesaraj, he had the largest of them all, right? And he had five legs, 
and four fucking arms. So six arms. There we go. These are the four Void Lords. And each of these Void Lords house one of these old gods. But each of these Void Lords have their own plans and machinations because remember, they are fully chaos. Now I ask you one... Or I'm going to pose just one question. What if them dying, so what if death was always the plan? all I'll ask. Earth is seemingly gathering up as much of that delicious blood as she can. Some think that she might even try, if she is actually a fifth old god, to reclaim her true form. Others think she's just trying oh, to slur- I'll, I'll, I'll add one more thing, just, just for those in the back that might not- It was always the plan because of The dark art. You can make the connections for yourself there. If you if you understand what the dark art is and what the dark art does, then the death of the old gods start to make a lot more sense. Slurp up some more power. Right now, we don't know her end game. But the second thing has obviously got to do with Hallowfall's light crystal. That thing is not natural to Azeroth. It fell from the sky. It got close to the core of our planet. I mean, hell, if it arrived long before the vision that the paladins got, then you could even say there's a chance that the whole fissure in that area was created when this light crystal fell from the sky. Or maybe that light crystal was targeted at the fissure. I don't know. I'm sure we'll find out soon. But why would the light do something like this? Well, that makes me think back to some recent interactions with light-aligned beings. We've got, say, the Ember Ward in Revendreth that's totally destroyed by the wrath of the light raining down from the sky, all pretty badass and metal. That's the light taking revenge. Then we've got Zira and her ideology with Illidan. I still want to, like, I still have a one, one major question about this entire thing. Why did the Necro Lords not come to help? When the Void invaded Bastion, the Necrolords were there to help. When the light invaded Ravendraith, the Necrolords were like, nah fam, you're on your own, good luck. And we should make it clear, the light came damn close to completely eradicating Ravendraith. Like, damn close. In fact, according to the lore, Revendreth was all but fucked. It, it was the Stone Mother. I, I believe it's called the Stone Mother. Uh, it was her creation that ultimately turned the tide. Because remember, the, the beings of Revendreth can't stand the light. So the light had a whale of a time kicking their ass, and yet the Necrolords never came to help. Why? and metal. That's the light taking revenge. Then we've got Zira and her ideology with Illidan. A being like her would obviously bind Azeroth without hesitation. So, who knows what this crystal is, but it seems the Nerubians definitely want it, and perhaps the crystal- Hey Big Thulu, there is absolutely no way that the Necrolord- that Ravendraith would be able to hide the war with the light. There's no way. It, it would quite legitimately not be possible. The, the light was destroying Ravendraith. There's no chance. N no shot. ...was even a weapon. We don't know yet. Now, this is all rather worrying. This crystal, of course, has a void phase. It acts a little bit like a narrow, which itself is rather suspicious. So, its void phase is essentially like the night to its light phase is day. The Arathi mm -hmm. worship this crystal as the bringing of life and fire of their sun. But at night, they lock the gates and they keep a lookout because void creatures begin appearing. Now, I'd only suspected it at first, but now, 
With there being a big light crystal in Hillsbrid, it all feels rather, like, connected, confirmed. I mean, Zalatath obviously will want to turn that light crystal in Hallowfall into a full void thing, right? She'll yep. probably want to get some sort of big voidy super weapon pointed at our world soul. So with some of those stakes from the War Within set up, let's go back 20 years to Season of Discovery. Uh-huh. On the Zorim Strand is the corpse of a twilight cultist artisan, his soul trapped unable to move on until his final mission is complete. He was an artisan for the cult, until one day, she appears in his dreams, this shadowy figure who showed him how to make something. She showed him how to make the box. It made things stronger, it made them better, but at a cost. This box was hungry. The box consumed blood and animal sacrifice, but it came out wonders, this was great. Problem is, it grew hungrier. Soon, the cult actually started sacrificing its own members to the box. And then the creations of the box themselves became hungry. And at that point, the Twilight Artisan kind of knew the darkness that he was dealing with with this box. It was making these well, things, yeah, nice. stronger and all of that, but also very hungry, without their own emotions anymore, purely driven by hate, by rage, and by hunger. Which, in a way, could even remind us of what Zalatath is doing with the Nerubians, of course, with the hungering essence of Galakrond. Regardless of that, the artisan tried to hide the box, but they knew it would not stay hidden forever. So they told us to find the box and how we could destroy it by using the holy light. So the next step is we get the box, and then we've got to find a powerful source of the holy light. And that is where we hear rumors of a star falling on the I hill. I see how it's connected. Hills. That's nice. Their paladins and sunwalkers are investigating. We turn up and we use the power of the crystal to destroy the box. And when we do, all that remains is a shard of the void that can be turned into some best in slot gear. And it's then that our shadowy figure appears, the very same that haunted the Twilight Artisan's dreams. The conversation is classic Zalatath. She says the Void Shard is very powerful and shouldn't just lie at the bottom of our bag. She compliments us, cajoles us, flatters us, threatens us, uh, but ultimately we do obviously take the power that she offers because Why we wouldn't want to we? kill things in Season of Discovery. So yeah. this could be a high elf obviously being influenced by Zalatath. Some others think, and it's a bit more of a harebrained theory, but because she says we're being boring again, some people think that it's actually our Zalatath who is free. And basically the model we see is the closest approximation to Well, to be fair, that would not be wrong. The void isn't necessarily tied to the timeline the same way that we are. So it is entirely plausible and possible for Zalatath to move al al along the timeline. So this could be our... Because remember, Zalatath, before Nazoth freed her, was in a blade. And we know that Zalatath was in that blade 20 years ago. How do we know this? Because there's stories of Zalatath going back hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, actually, in the blade, in blade form. So this would not be Zalatath from then. If this is Zalatath, it is almost certainly the Zalatath from our timeline that went back in time for something, some reason. Actual Zalatath that they can do within Classic without adding a bunch of new assets. So who knows? Uh, it could be that, or this could be the first time that we've interacted directly with her, or this could be one of the beings, a high elf, that uh, she is working through. I suppose the craziest thing you could say is that after the dawn of the infinite dungeon, maybe this is actually the point in time that she kind of re-enters Azeroth in, but I suppose that would be kind of mental and really messy. Basically, who the hell knows, but something's going on. Now there's another bit. This whole thing, right, it's playing out in the Hillsbridge foothills. And that's relevant because that is slap bang in the middle of where the Arathi came from. You know, the very same Arathi who went all the way over to Hallowfall because they got a vision of a falling star that turned out to be a light crystal. And here in Season of Discovery, we have a bunch of paladins seeing a vision and finding a big light crystal. At yep. the very least, it's Blizzard having a bit of a poke at us. Anyway, this being likely Zalatath closes by saying that she has left her mark on us, which signals to me that this is perhaps not the last. When my point is that you don't know who's going to find it, I can think of no more stalwart heroic, just a noble creature than yourself to bear it and take advantage of its gifts. I can show you a snap of the fingers and I can show you how to use it to make something truly special. 
You need only say the word. <laughs> I like that. Last time we will see her in the season of Discovery. And realistically, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, what did they say? They said these are found photos. These are confirmed to be canon. Therefore, what does Phase 2 look like? What is new in Nomergon? Will Zalatath maybe make an appearance in Stranglethorn? There's quite a lot to speculate about. Here's the deal. There's more seasons of Discovery. There's more lore there coming out over the rest of this year. We have seen previews of future phases with paladins using Death Knight spells. Now that's where it's fun, because before the Knights of the Ebon Blade, the vast majority of uh, Death Knights were fallen paladins. Yep. Arthas is obviously the ultimate example there, but yes, most early Death Knights were from a single group of paladins who tried to invade Northrend long before we ever got the chance. They got corrupted and were Arthas' earliest champions. Now, the thing is that Runak- Titanborn, knowing Blizzard, if you keep the crystal, Nothing happens. You can just talk to Zalatath again and ultimately make, quote unquote, the right choice. That, that's usually how it works with Blizzard. I don't think there's a separate story if you refuse it. Acquisition is already very lore rich. We've done things like weeding satyrs out of Teldrassil, praying at Azeroth's holy sites, and breaking into Shadowfang Keep for some deadly poisons. Just the same then with this Paladin Death Knight rune set. We've got to imagine they'll be going on some big thematic journey doing some terrible deeds to get their DK powers and you wonder what lore will happen there. But the biggest thing coming is definitely the Karazhan Crypt's raid. This actually is very long suspected to be a piece of cut content in the game. Yep. You actually could explore there. It's got some really just- Dude, this is one of the creepiest places on Azeroth. If you have never been in the Karazhan Crypts, do yourself a favor and go fucking check it out. It is creepy. Just creepy imagery, and certainly back in the day when I was getting started as a player, Karazhan Crypts was just one of the game's great mysteries that everybody sort of knew about and talked about. Now it's actually going to be in the game, and that's pretty big, because when it does come, Blizzard will fill those crypts with boss fights and other things. Those bosses will have lore, and there are few- I mean, look at that. Look at all these bodies just fucking tied up and, and floating there. This is, this is what WoW used to be, by the way. Dark as shit. This place is actually rated R, bro. The amount of hanging bodies and the torture is insane. True. I didn't think Sod was canon. Uh, Algren, I didn't think so either. Because I was told by one of the developers, this was a while back, granted, but I was told by one of the developers on Sod that it, it it isn't it's not not canon it's more just that it's not inventing anything new but now according to chris mason they are using it as a way to tell historical stories that will have an impact on retail wow so yeah it, it's sort of like if they need to do something in the past in order to make it make sense in the future, they can now use Season of Discovery in order to do that. Places on Azeroth more lore rich than Karazhan. What horrible creations did Medivh lock up there? What portals of void exist there? What can Zalatath find down there? And based on today, I'm not worried that this is just going to be a few random encounters with no lore, because if today's video is telling you everything, it's that people like Metzen are hands-on with Season of Discovery, that they're actually putting characters like Zalatath there, they're connecting stuff that she's- uh, There's a raid for the crypt coming, Epic Thulu. Up until this point, the crypt has never been used. It's a place, it's a massive place that you can explore, but there's never been anything in it. And one of the rumors has always been that that was content, that was cut. Blizzard had content planned there, but they never actually brought it to fruition. Although now in Season of Discovery, there's actually a raid that's going to go in there. He's doing in Season of Discovery to the content and the future of the game. This all feels intentional. It feels like there's more to come. That to me just makes this all more exciting. So as we come to the latter stages of phase one, let's consider what's next because it's not just some rerun of classic servers. No, this is a whole new horizon for WoW's oldest lore. And perhaps if you're the sort of player who really wishes a classic plus would happen, maybe this teaches us what Blizzard's approach to the lore would be. 
That is it for today's video. Of course, if you want to check out some other awesome lore videos, I've got a great one on Alune and on Anduin for you to check out. Big thanks, of course, to today's sponsor for helping to pay the bills. And with that said, I'll see you next time. I will say, probably the smartest way to use Season of Discovery from a lore perspective. Because I genuinely, like, I didn't even think of this. My thinking was, I don't know if you should use Season of Discovery as a lore thing, purely because it creates massive problems. You know, wh what you do in the past, now it re reverberates into the future. But this is like the perfect way to use it. Because it would be historical fact. Right, So these are things that happened in our history that you now get to play through. As long as they do it in such a way that it doesn't force people to go back and play it. I think we're fine. I think Blizzard is fine. It would be a problem if in order to understand retail stories, you must play Season of Discovery. I think that would cause a lot of people to be angry. But I don't know if that is the case, although some people are saying there's already people very angry because they feel like they're forced to play Season of Discovery, so I don't know.